In the first two years of the war in Europe, our eastern dominions were safe enough. Singapore stood guard at the tip of Asia, and Singapore was British yesterday. From the lands behind Singapore came the raw materials we needed to sustain our Commonwealth and to wage war against Hitler's Germany. Rubber from Malaya and Ceylon for the aircraft and armament factories of the West. Rice from the paddy fields of Burma for the people of Ceylon and India. Teak from the forests of the Burmese hills. Tin from Malaya. All these were vital to us, and their main defense that they were half a world away from our enemies. Throughout the East, distance and time are natural barriers. Only the long, fast flight of aircraft can overcome them, and aircraft have been few and far between. In 1941, a mere handful of British and Dutch squadrons could be spared to protect the whole of Southeast Asia. They routed their patrols across great spaces of jungle and sea, where a hundred thousand miles of undefended emptiness lay between our bases. This was the pattern of the Far East yesterday. Malaya, Singapore, Sarawa, British. Borneo, British and Dutch. Java and Sumatra, Dutch. The Philippines, American, Burma, Hong Kong, and Shanghai, British, Manchuria and Korea, Japanese, and Japan itself, the secret islands, the sacred islands of the rising sun. Japan, by 1941, had a powerful modern army, veterans of a 10-year war with China. This we knew. But we couldn't measure the strength behind their parading troops, the industry and strategy that hardened the imperial will. Their tanks and guns were copied from the West, their soldiers, peasants. And though we guessed the range of their ambition, we doubted their skill. Their strength lay in the air. Their army alone carried five air divisions, equipped with modern planes. Their navy was built around aircraft carriers and a naval air force of nearly a hundred groups. Their policy, control of the air, precedes control of the sea. December the 7th, 1941, they struck. The attack on Pearl Harbor had one simple objective, to destroy the American fleet in the Pacific. No troops would be needed, no landings, no bombardment. Just six aircraft carriers and about 300 planes.
harbour has blown the fuses right across the east. Yesterday is dead, and in Tokyo they've already planned tomorrow. Now the imperial forces can turn to the rich lands of Malaya and Burma and the Indies. The greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere is being established. On December the 10th, Japanese bombers and torpedo bombers fly from Cochin, China to attack Force Z. The American Pacific fleet is crippled, but the Royal Navy has sent Force Z into the South China Sea. Force Z comprises two battleships, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, with an escort of destroyers, but no aircraft. Within an hour, Force Z is destroyed. Control of the air has brought control of the sea. Now there is no Allied Navy in the east to challenge the Japanese invasion fleets. Now it can begin. On December the 18th, Japanese forces attack the island of Hong Kong. And the people of Hong Kong have no air defense. There can be no reinforcements for Hong Kong, no support, and no evacuation. By Christmas Day, 1941, over a third of the garrison have fallen, and the rest surrender. West of Hong Kong, the Malay Peninsula. The land frontier of Malaya is a flimsy, untenable line drawn through the jungle. The Japanese move in among the trees. The jungle war has begun, and time and distance are no longer on our side. Since the first day of war, the Japanese Army Air Force has been striking from the north attacking our airfields, shooting down our outnumbered planes, and bombing Singapore. In two months, our air defenses are destroyed, our ground forces broken, and Singapore falls. Japanese fleet can move down towards the Indies, where Java, Sumatra, and Borneo lie open to its guns and planes. On February the 15th, Japanese ground forces cross the Salween River into Burma. 
The way has been prepared for them by their air force, and they're opposed only by a small retreating army and by 37 British and American frontline planes. They are not delayed for long. Rangoon falls on March the 7th, Rome on the 1st of April, Lachio on the 28th, Mandalay on May the 1st. But long before the Japanese tanks arrive, Japanese bombers have achieved more than their military objective. The fields are empty and the towns deserted. Over a hundred thousand panic-stricken Burmese crowd the escape roads westward. And of these, less than half will reach India. Of all Southeast Asia, only the Philippines remain to be conquered. And these already are battered and half broken. remnants of the American garrison are cornered at Bataan and Corregidor and surrender on the 5th of May. The first phase is over. In five months the Japanese have become masters of the East. India and the Indian Ocean lie between the Japanese in the east and the German drive from the west. A British army stands along the mountain frontier of Burma. A British fleet is based on Ceylon. The Royal Air Force is deployed across India, from Calcutta to Karachi. In India, we build up an RAF command of six groups. India is a big country to understand, let alone defend, in a hurry. All the same, we shall try. In India, about 300 million people are praying for peace, while a few thousand of us get ready for the war. With reinforcements from Britain, we can build up the Air Force in India from five squadrons to 26, but the going is slow. We're the last on the world's list of priorities. The home front, the Middle East, the Pacific, all get their men and equipment before we do. The men who do arrive have other enemies to fight besides the Japanese. Distance, disease, and sheer tropical fatigue all take their toll of us. In spite of all this, we knock up a fighting air force. New aircraft arrive from the other side of the world. Even a few precious Spitfires for reconnaissance. 221 Group is reformed to Calcutta to cover the Burma front. 224 Group to defend Assam and Bengal. 225 Group at Bangalore to guard the rest of India. 226 Group for maintenance, 227 Group for training. And in Ceylon, 222 Group for the defense of the Indian Ocean and the Bay of Bengal. On Easter Sunday, 1942, the Japanese strike again. The pattern's the same as for Pearl Harbor, an air assault launched from a force of carriers. This time, the target's Ceylon, the new base of the British Far Eastern Fleet. But this time, we've had warning of the attack. In Ceylon, we're not very strong, but we're ready. Suicide patrols of our Catalina crews have kept us in touch with the enemy fleet. It's a noisy but not unprofitable Easter for us here. The Japanese fleet goes home some aircraft short and the center of operations reverts to Burma. The Japanese have cut the Burma road and broken our communications with the nationalist forces in China. So now we have a double task, 
to guard the Indian frontier and re-establish contact with the Chinese. On the ground, the British Indian 14th Army is born into the dark underworld of Burma jungle, where a mile a day is good going and the nights full of Japanese. Now we have a jungle air force to support the jungle army. When you can't see the wood for the trees, the only hope is to fly above them and find and attack the enemy from the air. This is what we're learning to do. Away to the northeast, we have a signals unit with the Chinese in Kunming. With the Burma road cut, the only way to reach them is by air. And by air, we can carry supplies to China and bring out refugees. We fly one aircraft a week, the Americans many more. This is the toughest and most treacherous air route in the world across the Path High Mountains, over the hump. Among the hills beneath us, work has started on a new road to China, the Lido Road. But that, like Victory, will take years to build. Here we're at the beginning of a whole new war. It stretches ahead of us, endless as the hostile jungle. And before we can even mount our first attack, the sky itself takes over. The monsoon rains begin, and we are stopped. The United States, 1942. There is no monsoon in America, but there's a tidal wave of effort and emotion as the world's most powerful nation goes to war. Roosevelt called Pearl Harbor a date which will live in infamy, but it has started up a machine which will produce the strongest army, navy, and air force in the world. We'll build 12,000 warships and 300,000 warplanes. As the Americans enlist, the United States government takes over command of operations in the Pacific. New carriers are sent through the Panama Canal to strengthen the Pacific fleet. While the British hold one flank of the Japanese empire, America prepares to hold the other. Australia and New Zealand lie between the two flanks in the direct line of Japanese attack. Up to now, our harbours, our cities, our homes, our farms have contributed to a very distant war. But now it has come near to us and we have to defend ourselves. 
as well as food and raw material, we start producing munitions and airplanes. Our squadrons fly alongside the Americans under General MacArthur's supreme command. MacArthur has made his headquarters here in Australia, and up on the north coast, Port Darwin has become an Allied base. Nothing as big as this has ever happened in Darwin before. The Japanese have taken hold of New Guinea, just north of us across the sea. And there we can hit back at them at last with troops and bombs. This steaming land of jungle-covered hills is our new battlefield. The Japanese Navy still dominates the Pacific and has sent a carrier force to support operations in the islands off the Australian coast. Here, the Battle of the Coral Sea is joined. But now the Americans have a carrier task force ready. A new era in sea warfare has begun, for in these battles, neither force ever sees the other. Both strike from the air while their enemy is still below the horizon. The carrier has become the capital ship of the fleet. Rebuffed at Ceylon and the Coral Sea, the Japanese turn east to attack Midway. That was in June, and we had a lucky break. We knew in advance they were coming, and we were ready for them. All the same, it was a close shave. They had a mighty big force, seven battleships, five carriers, cruisers, destroyers, the works. While we sent our planes to strap them, they sent theirs to strap us all hell broke loose. lost one carrier in that fight and a lot of planes besides. But they lost more than we did and beat it back home. So I suppose it paid off. Anyhow, the next time there was some attacking to do, we did it. The place was called Guadalcanal. They showed us the map. It was an island full of Japs. That was August. <laughs>
The Battle of Guadalcanal went on for months. You'll have heard about it, maybe. Anyhow, by February 43, the JPOs moved out and the CBs moved in. You could call it our first victory. Now, the CBs are a kind of frontline engineers, a solid bunch of guys. The Marines have a saying, never hit a CB, he may be your granddad. Anyhow, one of the things they make is landing strips. The idea is they're going to make landing strips all the way up the Pacific. On every island, we throw the Japs out on, right up to Tokyo. They've got a good deal of work ahead of them, because after all, this is only the beginning. When the Japanese began this war, they said, the main role in control of the sea has passed from the surface forces to the air forces. The Allies have learnt that lesson. By 1943, our strategy is firm. The men and machines are ready. The first air bases are built. The aircraft are coming in. 